What do you think about when you think about The Lord of the Rings? Another world? <laughs> I don't, I mean, when I think of Lord of the Rings, sorry, this is, I gotta, I gotta do the thing where I restate the question at the top of the answer. Ooh. Uh, size? Scale? I think scale and like lore and just how much detail is packed into like this artificial thing that came out of one person's mind. I think it's, for me, it's the oldest fantasy world I know. Despite me reading the books and playing video games for it, the movies are what I think about because the extended versions are my comfort movies to watch. Lord of the Rings to me means the beginning of fantasy to the extent that it's hard to think about fantasy without immediately thinking about Lord of the Rings. This is maybe stupid, but whenever I think of Lord of the Rings, the first thing I think of is Viggo Mortensen as Aragorn. I mean, the first thing is the movies. Action, adventure, the swords, elves, Frodo Baggins, <laughs> the One Ring, you know, all, all the normal stuff, yeah. When I think of Lord of the Rings, my mind goes through much the same list, although Increasingly, I've been feeling an excruciating amount of nostalgia and a severe longing to return to my childhood, which seems like a problem for my therapist. There is one more thing that comes to mind and stick with me here. Movie tie-in video games. So let me pose a similar question. What do you think about when you hear the phrase movie tie-in video games? I've played Lego Indiana Jones and Lego Star Wars. Do those count? A lot of times you go into it expecting a level of quality that like you're disappointed by it, but there are those few like gems here and there. Thinking about those games where there's glitches and weird things that happen because they were made so quickly. I remember playing growing up with my brother. We had the the King Arthur movie <laughs> video game on for GameCube. That it actually is pretty good. It is a lot of fun. I feel like it was just a given. You were like Oh, this movie's coming out. Can't wait to play the game. It's going to be maybe good. Your mileage may vary, but I'm guessing that your answers weren't quite as positive as they were towards The Lord of the Rings. However, the two are connected. I promise. I've been wanting to make this video for a very long time, but it wasn't until a few months ago that I finally figured out how I wanted to contextualize everything I want to share with you. So, this video will have two sections. The first is about how a team of developers adapted Peter Jackson's iconic Lord of the Rings film trilogy into two video games for EA in the early 2000s. The second part is about what happened when those same developers tried to create a bleeding edge, first of its kind, open world Lord of the Rings RPG that never got released. But before we get into any of that, I need to remind you, please like and subscribe. Also come join our Discord server, we're awesome. We have a ton of cool people who are there and just share memes, it's great. I think I'm gonna put the sword down because I feel like I'm threatening you. Yeah, let's get started. <laughs> Even the thought of it, no. My, my nose and ears were bleeding. Yeah, they were. Uh, you gotta love your castmates. By late 2000, production on Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings trilogy was nearly finished, with just a few short months left of principal photography. And although no one would watch its first entry, The Fellowship of the Ring, until December of 2001, the minds of executives who held the video game rights to J.R.R. Tolkien's epic fantasy trilogy were already giddy with anticipation. Now, I am not going to get into the weeds of rights ownership and who could publish what based on which highly specific part of the Lord of the Rings books, because honestly, it's an absolute nightmare. All you need to know is this. In 2001, Vivendi began an eight-year contract with Tolkien Enterprises, giving them the right to publish the less than stellar The Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring video game in September of 2002, which was a full year after the film came out. Now you might be thinking, is this a prequel to EA's The Lord of the Rings The Two Towers game that was inexplicably released the very next month? No, it's not. It's very confusing. See, Vivendi's game was not based on Peter Jackson's film, and it was only able to directly reference and utilize certain parts of the book, The Fellowship of the Ring. However, EA's game, The Lord of the Rings The Two Towers, was directly based on Peter Jackson's film and was able to use assets from the film in its production. I'm gonna be honest, rights suck 
but they suck infinitely more when you're talking about the Lord of the Rings because of just how many people want to monetize Middle Earth. I blame capitalism and the fact that the Tolkien estate probably just wants to rake in as much money as humanly possible. Regardless, EA's The Two Towers video game is a direct adaptation of Peter Jackson's first two films in his Lord of the Rings trilogy, The Fellowship of the Ring and The Two Towers, which makes it even more confusing because now you have one video game trying to combine two films and mesh their stories together into one cohesive product that makes sense to players of the game who are playing it before the film comes out. So instead of me getting flustered and continuing to rant and rave like an absolute lunatic, I'm gonna let two people who actually developed multiple Lord of the Rings video games for EA in the early 2000s do it for me. Please give a warm subpixel welcome to Chris Tremel and Steve Gray. My name is Chris Tremel. Um, you know, I've been in the industry now since about 1992. Uh, well, I've been in the gaming industry a long time. I uh, actually started out uh, working in visual effects. Um, I was in uh, LA, I worked at places like Rhythm and Hughes and Digital Domain. So I was actually working for EA.com. They wanted to do Lord of the Rings games and they ended up just because of the people I knew, uh, I ended up going over to uh, for that team and um, I ended up running that team. You know, I ended up at EA working on Lord of the Rings. And so when I first arrived there, we were actually working on something for Return of the King because the first movie had already been out and had been a massive success. The Two Towers video game actually started out as a standalone Aragorn adventure game that was being developed by Stormfront Studios. But when EA saw the success that Peter Jackson had with the films, they immediately retasked Stormfront and then added in EA Redwood Shores, who would later become Visceral Games, to change the entire scope of that game to focus entirely on adapting The Two Towers, which was the next film to be released. You know, once, once we realized how popular the film was, it became apparent that we needed to deliver an experience that represented the film as closely as possible. We're working with a studio that had already been working on a different version of the game for a year or two. So there was a lot of pivoting and a lot of a lot of changing into what the game actually became. I mentioned it before, but the Two Towers video game is a combination of the first two films in Jackson's trilogy. This was due to timing on EA's part, but the decision to incorporate aspects and story beats from both films put the onus on the developers to figure out exactly the type of pacing that they wanted players to experience on top of a ton of tech development that needed to be done and fast tracking of major parts of development all under a really strict deadline that EA had set about a year. Well, we, we wanted to tell the whole story because we kind of wished that we'd started, like really started from the beginning, like that there had been a real first game. But the thing that I remember the most about this is really pushing the tech trying to get like these huge scenes um, to actually work. And that was a big struggle. And we, we spent a lot of time, you know, trying trying to find the right balance of, you know, you want everything to look really good, but you know, this was old crappy hardware. Since we didn't do a fellowship version, when we released Two Towers, the, the hype of the franchise in general was really, really high. So, you know, that game just turned out to be really fun. It was a fun game. It was a lot of hard work, a lot of iteration on what we thought would make it fun and, and building off of these really core basic mechanics of the hack and slash genres. The effort of the team to create something that wasn't just representative of the films, but also felt fresh and new from a gameplay perspective clearly came with massive challenges. The teams at Stormfront and Redwood Shores pushed themselves harder than ever in order to bring the same authenticity that Jackson had in his films directly into the games. Even getting something as simple as the transition from cinematic to gameplay was hugely important. Since the development team was allowed to use footage and audio from the movies as well, they incorporated a lot of FMV segments between levels to weave the story together. Out of this came one of the most memorable parts of both games, the film to gameplay transition. We had a goal of making it to where if you came into the room and saw the game out of the corner of your eye that you might for a second think that it's actually the film. 
So they had this idea of, of doing this transition of going from film into game. The very first one that was prototyped was the one of the Urukai at Helm's Deep. And so the way that one works is it's got film footage and the film footage transitions to pre-rendered footage. And then that pre-rendered footage transitions into the actual gameplay. Where we knew that we really got that right was on the first battle in the second age with the Sildur, when that cross fades, most people wouldn't start playing because they thought they were still in the in the film footage part of it. That I think is once we had that version of it working in that level, that was when we knew that that we had accomplished what we were trying to do. But by the time we got to Return of the King, you know, those were definitely a trademark of the of the game itself. And I don't think I've really seen that in other products. This is one point I really want to focus on because to me, it's central to why these two games, the Two Towers and then later on The Return of the King, are often lauded as being two of the better movie tie-in video games. The passion and the dedication that everyone who worked on these games and developed them is right there to be seen on screen as you play. Okay, for example, the development team sent one of their own to live and work in Wellington, New Zealand at Weta Digital and their entire job, the entire reason that they were there was for the sole purpose of cataloging and tagging digital assets from Weta so that the dev team could then use those same assets in game. And I think stuff like that tends to make a really big difference when you're talking about authenticity because you are then able to translate what people know and feel is authentic from the films into something that they're then able to interact with in a game. But that alone doesn't make a game great. You need more than just authenticity. We were all f fanatics. I mean, the, the, it was so cool to be able to work on this stuff, you know, because we all read the books probably more than once. I know I did when I was in, in high school. And um, so it was really, I mean, it was, it was like we felt obligated to try and really, really do something great. And, you know, the, the Redwood Shore studio, they really supported us. Like they, they gave us a lot of latitude to go do the things that we really wanted to do. But that was definitely not a, a machine project, right? I mean, we were all super, super, super big fans of, of the books and the movies and really wanted to do something that, that would somehow do them justice or something. You seeing the making of these films, you see how incredibly challenging they were and how risky and expensive they were. But Peter Jackson is a, true visionary. I believe that Lord of the Rings was, is the best work that he's ever done. So we had, a, we had great source material. Our leadership team are some of the best leaders that I've ever worked for. Neil Young was our um, main boss. Steve Gray was Neil Young's partner. When you can inspire a team through a vision that is held that tightly, the drive and, and the dedication of the team becomes even stronger. And so I think it was kind of the perfect storm of we had great source material. We had an incredible vision for what Neil wanted the game to be. And we had great developers um, through Stormfront Studios and through Electronic Arts that wanted to make the best possible games that we could. The team's hard work paid off and the two towers ended up outselling EA's pretty conservative estimates. And we had a huge success with it. You know, I think the sales projections were maybe 900,000 and we ended up selling like four or five million copies. So obviously for EA at that point, it was a, a, a massive victory. And I think for most of us, on those teams, that was probably our biggest products that we had ever worked on at the time. The struggles that the team at Stormfront Studios and EA Redwood Shores had to work through during development of the Two Towers meant that when the time finally came for them to start developing The Return of the King, things went a lot smoother. 
I think this is really evident in a lot of the presentational factors of The Return of the King. Everything from the texture work, to the lighting, to the level design, to the combat, it all feels so much tighter and just way more refined. And that's even more evident when you play from the two towers directly into The Return of the King. The team was absolutely hitting their stride and the work that they produced clearly shows that. You know, at that point, EA still somehow believed that you could do these high-end games in one year. So it's just, it's kind of brutal. I think the truth is that we did, you know, we had, we were trying to do all this stuff on, on the, the two towers, but we couldn't really pull it off because we didn't have the time or the, you know, we were constantly moving around. And But then on Return of the King, it was all sort of settled in and we were able to make those things happen. Now that's not to say that development was at all easy on Return of the King but the access that they had to the film assets and especially to the voice talent and motion capture talent allowed for a much more fluid translation of those elements into the game. Having Elijah Wood and Ian McKellen and Viggo Mortensen voice their in-game characters meant that in addition to the authentic sounds and motions being showcased, Redwood Shores could capture additional behind the scenes footage with those same actors and then use it within the game. Having those behind the scenes moments, knowing that the actors who played the Hobbits were discussing who was a better gamer, those things really humanize what's on screen and it reminds you of the feeling that you had when you watched the behind the scenes stuff in the movies. And as any fan of Tolkien or Lord of the Rings will tell you, that's a really good feeling to feel. Everyone that we worked with on that side of things was really awesome. And and it varied from, from like Elijah and Sean Astin and those guys were gamers, but they were so into it. So getting to do that stuff with these guys was really natural and really easy. And then it became kind of funny because then when you would get up to like Ian McKellen or, or Christopher Lee and they weren't gamers at all, you know, and they, you know, but watching them play and, and seeing their authentic reactions to seeing themselves in the game was probably what made those elements really fun. People like Viggo Mortensen, who he's like a tr true Renaissance man in real life. And he's not a big gamer. And his son, at the time, they weren't really big video game people. And so watching someone like him look at the game and some of the things he was saying, like there's ninjas in there or something, you know, for that make this stuff happen. You know, those were probably some of my favorite things that, that we that we got to do. By all accounts, both the Two Towers and the Return of the King games sold extremely well after release, and EA rode that wave with other titles, hoping to capitalize on the parallel success of the films. But for the teams who developed those games, the release of The Return of the King marked a milestone. I don't know if I've ever really worked on anything that hard since. The team was also, I mean, it's its, it's a sort of classic story, right? People who are, are gamers or work on games or artists doing computer graphics, I mean, everybody is into Tolkien. It was, uh, it was just really exciting to be able to do something cool. It was a, a cl super cliche sounding, a really magical time in my life and in my career and probably the hardest work that I've ever done and some of the hardest times that I've ever gone through. But it by far is some of the most successful stuff I've ever created. And it's still loved to this day. Adapting a film into a video game is no small feat, but doing it twice to critical and commercial success while under an enormous time constraint is so impressive. The Two Towers and the Return of the King games had a pretty significant impact because me and so many other people who played them still remember how it felt all these years later. I don't know, the levels had serious challenges, but it wasn't impossible. There was a, a couple times where I rage quit. I do remember that. I don't remember where. And I, I routinely talk about that game. I talk about it with friends who, you know, ask me questions about like, like, were you a Nintendo household growing up? Were you a PlayStation household? Um, what were your favorite games for XYZ? And every time someone brings up the PS2, I'm like, two towers, absolutely. We're talking about specific levels uh, that we either found hard or challenging or things that stood out to us. And that in and of itself tells you that it's a great game because there was something in the game that made us want to keep playing it and that we remember the graphics for the time. I think this was 2002. This was 
22 years ago. They were great for that time. It wasn't just a copy and paste from a movie to a game. They were amazing. And on top of it all, with, with everything and all the hard work that they put in, the actual actors voiced the characters in the game. That was so cool to me. Like, and it still is. It's wild that they were able to get most of them to come voice these characters. And it created its own world within that game that stood on its own from the movies. Two Towers is the first time I, I was like, confident that I was good at video games or like video games was my thing because my brother and his friend couldn't beat it was like two or three cave trolls you had to fight in Fangorn Forest and they could not beat them and I beat them and they were like they were like Will can you beat them for us and I was like yeah and I beat them and uh, the rest is history. I've played these games dozens of times I mean my teenage years were filled with hours and hours of me replaying the same levels over and over and over again, not just to improve my playstyle, but also to unlock all of the hidden content that I could. These games are so special to me because when you get that content, when you sort of dive into the world that they create, you become closer to them and by extension, the movies that they're adapting. And to me, these games are incredibly well done adaptations of something that I already love. But what happens when a game studio wants to take things a step further? What happens when there is no film to adapt? When there's no narrative you can simply copy over? And when ambition and talent run up against reality and a publisher's bottom line? Cool. Thanks, man. Welcome to Project Grey Company. My name is Chris Trimble, I'm the creative director on the game. And uh, what is Project Grey Company, you're probably asking. The Lord of the Rings, The White Council, was an unreleased, story-driven, open-world, cooperative RPG set between the events of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Based on both Peter Jackson's film version of Middle-earth and using various story beats derived from the books, players would have been able to create a bespoke character with a detailed lineage, complete different quests around various sections of the world, and eventually assist the White Council in defending Middle-earth against a growing darkness. The game was officially announced in 2006 after more than a year of development, and was slated tentatively to be released in late 2007. It's difficult to find a ton of information on the White Council these days, and what's out there is often incredibly low res and sparse. IGN has a few articles and some pieces of concept art and even a few developer diaries floating around. Some sites will reference EA's press release about the game, but even the official page that EA launched back in 2006 just gives you a 404 error. Essentially, it's completely dead in the water. But what exactly happened? Why would a game that promises something every fan of Lord of the Rings has dreamed of being able to experience never make it out of development? Well, it was it was like our dream project, right? Like like the Lord of the Rings should be an RPG. I mean, it should not be like a. I mean, it's it's great that it had like you know the other games had these you know this sort of rapid, fast paced action fighting stuff. But I mean, the Lord of the Rings is an RPG. I mean, it, it just is, and um, that's what we always wanted to do. And we. Um, you know, then the, the EA studio was pretty supportive, right? They let us get started and we did a lot of work and I think a lot of cool stuff. By the time we had finished the Third Age, we had also done Lord of the Rings Tactics at that point, plus the Game Boy game. So we had done maybe five or six Lord of the Rings games. The films were probably at the point where the DVDs were already out. You know, one thing that we weren't really interested in is retelling the same stories again. At the start of the White Council's development back in 2005, only a few studios had ever successfully created and sold an open world game on the level that the White Council was attempting to create. Mainly, Rockstar, creators of GTA. So this was going to be the first new generation of Lord of the Rings titles. There was a big push in the industry at the time and a big push internally at EA to pursue open world style games. GTA San Andreas was just a mega hit, you know, and EA 
started getting into like the godfather which was an open world game and you know there were games like oblivion and oblivion obviously on the 360 just blew everyone away and so you know that's something that we all want, were interested in as as a team it's important to understand the context that the White Council was being developed within. The gaming industry was about to experience one of the most critically and commercially successful years ever, 2007. Games like Assassin's Creed, Mass Effect, Portal, The Witcher, Uncharted, Crackdown, Crisis, all of those games were about to make a huge impact on the industry, and the White Council was nearly two years into development by the time 2007 was coming around, and it still had a massive amount of technology that was only in the prototyping phase. You know, so, so there were there were a few challenges. One was building an engine that worked, uh, allowed us to author open world. Another one was everyone wanted this game to be online. So they wanted it to be cooperative, which is also a big challenge. I'm not sure if there were a lot of those at the time. I think maybe Saints Row was coming up and there may have been some others, but so we had that that we were up against as well. The scope of this game was huge and really huge on a level that Rockstar had experience with and not many other studios. Some of the concepts that Chris was talking to me about were wild to imagine experiencing prior to 2010. And even today, some games may implement a few of them, but definitely not all at the same time. Here are some examples. You know, I think one of the big aspects of White Council from a game design side of things, there were a couple of big things. So the first big thing was crafting. And crafting went all the way from crafting a weapon all the way through crafting your character. In the beginning, what you could do was when you were put building your character, you chose all these different things that weren't necessarily visually represented directly. So you might have chosen a dwarf who comes from the Iron Mountains. You would choose who his father was. You could choose who his mother was. And there was all these different pieces that you would use to put together this character. And a lot of that was inspired by The Sims. We were working a lot with The Sims Next Gen team in regards to looking at their systems and, and talking a lot with them about how they were putting things together. So, so that was a huge part of it. The other things that you could craft, there was spell crafting where you would be able, we were working with the spore team. So we were using a similar approach, but with spells. So you would find these different runes in the world and then you could combine these runes and the runes would create unique spells. And so one rune might represent what culture the spell comes from. One rune might represent the element that the spell is associated with. And then one could be the type of effect. Is it an AOE or a direct attack? And then you could also influence the colors and, and stuff like that. And, and we had that working and it was pretty incredible. There is one specific thing that when Chris brought it up to me, I have been unable to stop thinking about it. So imagine for a second that you have developed five or six games based on Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings trilogy. You're pretty happy with the stuff you've worked on, but you're maybe getting a little bit tired of the same old, same old, specifically with the music. As great as that music is, as much of a language unto itself that it is, and as much of a genius that Howard Shore is, you want to hear some different stuff. The teams at EA Redwood Shores thought much the same, and they came up with a wild idea. We had the concept of using songs from Led Zeppelin. Now, if you don't know, Led Zeppelin wrote a lot of stuff about Lord of the Rings. So if you look at the lyrics for Ramble On, Ramble On is about, it's actually about Frodo going to Rivendell. There's quite a bit of fantasy reference in original Led Zeppelin, including Lord of the Rings references. 
Um, and there's some great songs like Achilles Last Stand. And so we thought, well, how cool would it be to actually get these songs into the game? And we felt it would make us really unique. And so we actually were in contact with their management and they took the concept to a couple of the guys, at least to Jimmy Page. And there was some interest in him scoring the game. It never worked out, but uh, the videos and and concept stuff that we had put together that used those songs were pretty impactful and people thought we were crazy which we probably were but you know you gotta shoot your shot when when you have an idea like that i don't know if jimmy page ever noodled around on his guitar between 2005 and 2007 but if he did and if it was specifically for the point of scoring music for a then unreleased lord of the rings video game produced by ea i hope someone shows him this video and specifically this part because i would love to hear what you came up with jimmy uh something about led zeppelin and lord of the rings just kind of feels right on like a primal level it might seem wrong but i think it's right So, what then happened to the White Council? You might have guessed it already based on just how ambitious this game was turning out to be before an engine was even built, but there's a few other factors at play beyond just its scope. At that point, you know, there weren't any more movies. The feeling at EA was that it was sort of fading from from view, like the public public's eye had moved on, and uh, there was some fateful meeting like the Redwood Shore Studio would have these exec team meetings and somebody said something. There was like some Lord of the Rings themed olive oil or something like that. <laughs> some product like that that was released in Europe somewhere or in Italy or that was brought up in sort of an unkind reference of, you know, this this franchise is just not really relevant anymore and you guys are, are, I mean, if you do what you're planning to do, you're going to spend an enormous amount of money and we don't want to do it. The scope of the project was such that it was going to take us a, a long time to build and to figure out. You know, at the beginning of a hardware cycle, you see a lot of new IP. Um, but then usually what will happen is if that if those IPs aren't successful, towards the last half or the end of a hardware cycle, you will start to see companies doing a lot more licensed products. After a couple of years, EA was a lot more interested in investing in original IP. Uh, the license for The Lord of the Rings was coming to a close and the reality of how long it was going to take us to get to where we needed to be far outlived the license and the company felt that investing in the orig in original IP was a better choice than investing in a license like Lord of the Rings which I don't you know I I can't you know as a business call I can't blame them for it um, it was usually disappointing I mean, it was just like, I mean, I think I basically had decided to quit at that point. Like, uh, fuck this shit. We're all really bummed because it was, it would have been a really, really good game. I mean, the team was like a, t you know, top flight, you know, the best of all the people we met in the, you know, in the, in the previous years. And like, we wanted all aspects of it to be really sort of over the top, but, but then it wasn't. The White Council represents, to me, an idealized version of a game that I have always wanted to play. Steve said it best, The Lord of the Rings is an RPG. It deserves a game with the scope and scale to match that of the films that we all love. And I even understand why a game like The White Council doesn't exist. I think that what Monolith did with games like Shadow of Mordor and Shadow of War are really interesting open world games set in Middle Earth but even they don't reach the promise that the White Council had. I crave an experience where I can take my custom elf or dwarf or human character through the different levels of Minas Tirith or ride their horse across Rohan as the red sun rises. But unfortunately, a game like that just doesn't exist. 
at least not yet. A mix of overly ambitious ideas, poor timing, and an unenthusiastic publisher would stop any game from being finished. I think it just hurts knowing what could have been. Maybe one day we'll get a game that eclipses even the ambitions of the White Council, a truly open world Middle Earth RPG where we can all live out our Lord of the Rings fantasies, but until then, we'll have to make do with the movies and movie tie-in games, which, let's be honest, isn't a bad consolation prize. And the team ended up kind of splitting up. I left and went to Treyarch. Steve Gray ended up going to work at Tencent. Um, and everybody kind of went off. Some stayed in EA and some went on to other projects at other companies. You know, it's always tough to work on something like that for that amount of time and have it taken away or have it canceled. But it was, you know, it was incredibly fun. It was a good, a good time for myself to move on. And, you know, I think that everyone looks back on all of the years that we spent on all of those titles as some of the best years that we've had in the industry, some of the most challenging times, but some of the biggest successes that we've ever had. So what is the moral of this video? Does there even need to be one? Maybe. Uh, if there is, it's twofold. I think the first part is, if you get the chance to adapt a piece of art or entertainment that you love, strive with all your being to make that thing great. There are any number of elements in this world that will try to take things away from you to make them worse, but if enough people push to make something better, it'll most likely be that way. And two, having something fall apart in front of you that you've worked on for years is not the end of the world. It may feel like it, but it's not. I think what Chris and Steve said about them and the team and what they went on to after the White Council speaks volumes to that. And I know in my own life, that tends to be true. This very channel, Subpixel, would not exist had not that exact same thing happened to Will and Ian and Jake and me. So, with all that being said, after this very long video, I don't know if there's anything else to say, except for... Here's to things falling apart in spectacular fashion. Oh, this video was an insanely long endeavor for me, and if you made it to the end, I'd like to thank you. I would also like to thank uh, Chris Tremel, Steve Gray, Belinda Haywood, Chris Ferreria, uh, David Curtis Hill, and Wright Bagwell for speaking with me about these games, even if you just wanted to share a thought or two, or none at all. You guys helped make games that me and so many other people cherish, so thank you. Also, I would like to thank my other friends who suffered through multiple different interviews of me asking very weird questions about Lord of the Rings and video games you may or may not have ever played. Thank you for being willing to do that. Uh, Will, Karen, Jake, Ian, Connor, Sarah, Jimmy, uh, you guys are the best. And one last person to thank is actually my friend Nathan Wagner. He suggested that I make this video when I joked about it in my previous James Bond video, so... That was almost a year ago. I finally took up his advice. Thank you, Nathan. Please remember to like and subscribe. Join our Discord. We're really friendly. We make very dumb jokes. I promise you, you will enjoy it. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.